uh, okay. So first of all, uh, let me thank Luca, Giorgio, Leila for uh, having me and for organizing such a great workshop. So um, starting from the late 80s, uh, uh, refusal has been the focus of much philosophical attention. A uh, series of works in feminist philosophy of language, for example, has been exploring the thesis that pornography may silence women's sexual refusals. Um, legal theorists working on rape law uh, have placed emphasis on the importance of verbal refusal when it comes to sexual encounters. So to borrow a feminist motto, no means no. Uh, the sexual arena is just one area in which uh, refusal has been deemed to be central. Uh, the medical field is another, so ethics scholars, as is well known, uh, have been discussing uh, about whether and to what extent people have a right to refuse life-sustaining uh, treatment, for example, and uh, what kinds of dilemmas such a right would give rise to for physicians. Now, uh, uh, despite uh, uh, the attention that refusal has been garnering, uh, uh, well, uh, as far as I know, no detailed speech act analysis of refusing has thus far been advanced. Uh, well, the paper that I'm going to present uh, aims to fill this gap. The presentation uh, will consist of three main sections. In section one, I'll delve into speech act analysis of refusals. Uh, the pragmatics of refusal will turn out to be more complex than it may look at first. Indeed, I will argue that our ordinary concept of refusal uh, actually captures a whole family of speech acts that share some uh, properties, but also differ in important ways. In section two, I will uh, defend my proposal against some potential objections. And I'll conclude in section three by drawing some potential uh, implications that my analysis has for certain current discussions around silencing, consent to sex, and rape law. All right, so. The first thing to note is that refusals are clear instances of illocutionary acts. So uh, the, this is shown by various factors. The first is that the verb refuse can be used performatively. So one can refuse solely by saying that one is refusing. Relatedly, uh, utterances of the form, I refuse to do such and such, uh, meet Austin's hereby criterion. Moreover, a refusal can fully succeed, even if the causal effects it typically brings about do not obtain. So for example, I can fully succeed in refusing a second slice of my grandmother's apple pie, even if she serves it to me nonetheless. Right, in spite of, uh, 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 of the fact that these remarks are pretty obvious, uh, uh, refusals do not figure among the locutionary acts listed by Austin, and hardly anything is said in Austin's work about refusing. Uh, something more can be found in Searle and Van der Weyken's foundations of illocutionary logic. A refusal, they write, is the illocutionary denegation of an acceptance. One can only accept or refuse a speech act that allows for the option of acceptance or refusal. Uh, we can draw uh, two important insights from this. Uh, the first is that refusals are the negative counterparts of acceptances. And like acceptances, they have both a directive and a commissive sense. So uh, Sora and Van der Weyken suggest that when I accept that you do something, I am trying to direct your conduct and thus I'm performing a directive. Um, on the contrary, when I say yes to your request that I do something, uh, well, I commit myself to doing it, 
thereby performing a commissive. So as a general boom, uh, interrogative commissives such as offers uh, invite the HIVA to perform a directive, whereas interrogative directives such as requests uh, are replied to with commissives. Well, uh, things, however, are not that simple uh, for um, Interrogative speech acts typically have a hybrid nature, combining both directive and commissive elocutionary force. Uh, so consider, for example, the act of inviting. Suppose that Lily invites Philip to a Halloween party at her house. Well, in so doing, Lily clearly tries to direct Philip's conduct, but um, more than that is involved. If Lily invites Philip at her party and when the day comes, she refuses to let him in, well, he will have grounds to object. And this is because invitations also have a commissive component. Uh, the inviter does not merely try to direct uh, the invitee's conduct, well, they also uh, take on some commitments, they commit to some uh, future behaviors. Such a hybrid nature, I claim, is passed on to the yes or no response that follows. So imagine that Philip accepts the invitation. Well, in so doing, Philip commits to show up at the party, but also directs Lily's conduct in certain ways. Um, the same would go if Philip refused. In refusing, he would be committing not to show up at the party and, say, make Lily set one less place at the dinner table. So this strongly suggests that acceptances and refusals fall within the category that Michael Ancher calls commissive directives. Uh, sometimes it is uh, their directive nature that is predominant, as we saw in example one. Other times, it is their commissive nature that takes over, as we saw in example two. But more often, uh, they are clearly two-faced, as the Halloween party case shows. The second and strictly related suggestion that we can draw from Serling van der Weyken's passage is that refusals cannot be accomplished in isolation. Refusals are, as they put it, second turn elocutions. For an utterance to be a refusal, it must occur in response to some previous speech act put forth by the HIVA. Such, such speech acts include requests, proposals, invitations, offers, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can put this, if you wish, in the parlance of conversation analysts uh, and say that refusals are second parts to adjacency pairs. Right, that being the case, uh, any satisfactory analysis of refusals has to go through an analysis of the first turn locations uh, to which they respond. What I call first turn elocutions uh, uh, are a subclass of what Mark Lanz and Quill Kukla have named calls. Calls may be defined as second person elocutions that call for a specific response on the part of the HIVA. Calls create reasons for action and therefore reshape the normative context they occur in. At the same time, calls are enabled or precluded by the pre-existing normative relationship between the participants. So for example, consider the act, the act of ordering. An order imputes an obligation upon the HIVA, thereby adjusting the normative context. And at the same time, it can be felicitously issued only by a speaker with some sort of power or authority over the HIVA. Simplifying a little, we can divide calls into two main categories, closed or imperative calls and open or interrogative calls. Both generally aim to make the HIBA do something, but their normative action is profoundly different. A successful closed call, such as an order or a command, results in an obligation on the part of the HIBA. 
A successful open call, such as a request or a proposal, gives the heaver a reason to do what was requested, but such a reason does not take the form of an obligation. Lanz and Kukla give the name petitionary reasons to the peculiar kind of reasons created by open calls. Petitionary reasons, uh, <clears throat> and I quote from Lanz and Kukla, are not just weak obligations, nor are they obligations baked up by weak desires on the part of the requester. They are a different variety of reason altogether. So open calls and close calls, interrogatives and imperatives have distinct normative profiles and thus are irreducible to each other. In particular, the, the normative function of an open call is to petition the recipient to do such and such while leaving the decision to accept or refuse up to her. So uh, open calls constitutively present the HIVA with a choice. Uh, it follows from these that open calls and open calls only are first turn illocutions. While an imperative uh, calls for compliance, that is for a behavioral response that fulfills the obligation imputed on the HIVA, um, an interrogative primarily calls for an illocutionary response in the part of the HIVA, which typically takes the form of a yes or a no. One fruitful way to unpack the notion of petitionary reason and to a certain extent to reduce the distance between imperatives and, uh, and interrogatives is I think to conceive of petitionary reasons as conditional obligations. Obligations that get created only if the HIVA answers affirmatively. So going back to our previous example, um, if Lily invites uh, uh, Philip to a party at her house and Philip accepts, well, he will eo ipso acquire a commitment to show up at the party. But crucially, such an obligation on his part is not created by Lily's invitation. It is created by his accepting. It. So normatively speaking, acceptances amount to providing the condition under which the, the obligations uh, uh, conditionally produced by open calls get created. Refusals, by contrast, amount to blocking the creation of those obligations. Right, so thus far I have argued that refusals are second term elocutions performed in response to open calls. In what follows, I will suggest that the success conditions of refusal vary with the type of open call that they respond to. Uh, in particular, the, the nature of the open call performed determines whether the refusal act that may follow is governed by an authority rule. So in order, uh, typically, no particular kind of entitlement is needed to refuse an open call. If my housemate requests that I wash the big pile of dishes in the sink, I can refuse while politely stating some excuses or reasons simply in virtue of being the addressee of her call. And similarly, if a friend of mine asks me out to the movie, I am ipso facto entitled to refuse her proposal uh, without there being any, any other condition in place but that she was addressing me. Notice that the same applies when the relationship between the participants is not symmetric. So suppose a charitable master asks her servant in the gentlest possible term, terms to run a certain errand. Well, if the master is genuinely requesting rather than indirectly ordering, the servant will be free to refuse in spite of lacking any sort of authority over the interlocutor. So taking the cue from these examples, we can maintain that uh, in order to successfully reply to an open call, a speaker must merely satisfy a relevance criterion. That is, she must be the one called or she must have been licensed to respond for her by the relevant addressee. 
Uh, this can be put in Sir Leon terms, if you wish, is the conjunction of two preparatory conditions. So first, the HIVA is previously performed, some open call, and second, the speaker is the addressee of the call, or they are a person who has been licensed to respond by the addressee of the call. Now, uh, this is, however, not the old story. And this is so because to reply to certain sui generis requests, uh, a speaker must actually have some kind of authority. So consider the utterances that follow. Uh, would, wash the dishes, would you wash the dishes, please? And may you use your laptop? So in uttering three, Philip, the speaker, is asking Lily, the Hiva, to do something. In uttering four, Philip is seeking to obtain a concession to act in a particular way. The first is a simple request. The second is a request for permission. Uh, it's an aside, a useful test to assess the nature of a given request, so whether it is a simple request or a request for permission, is to examine which individual will be performing the activity represented in the proposition. So uh, once, uh, uh, it's, um, once accepted, simple requests uh, commit uh, primarily commit the requestee to doing something. Uh, on, th on the contrary, when a permission request gets granted, uh, it, is, uh, it is the requester, the one who will be performing the action in question. So uh, a positive reply to three would commit, primarily commit Lily to doing something, namely to washing the dishes, but a positive reply to four would give Philip a certain right that he didn't have before, a right to do something, namely a right to use Lily's laptop. Now, in the case of three, Lily can successfully accept or refuse simply in virtue of being the addressee of the call. In the case of four, Lily can accept or refuse in virtue of being the addressee of the call and crucially the laptop's owner. So suppose that Philip believes that the laptop belongs to Lily when it is actually Kate's property. Under such circumstances, Lily would not be entitled to accept or refuse because the activity represented in the proposition, namely using a certain salient laptop, would not fall under her jurisdiction. Otherwise put, Lily would lack the requisite authority. So generalizing from this, uh, uh, we can claim that when it comes to replying to requests for permission, the relevance criterion is to be supplemented by an authority requirement, according to which certain speaker is entitled to reply to a request for permission whenever she has authority over the involved activity or whenever she has been authorized to by the entitled individual, that is by the individual as authority over the activity in question. Right, so it should be clear at this point that uh, our ordinary concept of refusal applies to a multiplicity of speech acts which share the property of being negative second turn elocutions, meaning that they all are negative replies to some interrogative uh, call put forth by the HIVA and differ from one another in that they reply to different kinds of open calls. Moreover, as we saw, some of them require speaker authority while others do not. Well, this observation has led me to conceive of refusal in terms of a speech act family. Now, uh, even though there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between performative verbs and elocutionary acts, we can still check for English verbs uh, marking particular acts in the, in the refusal family. I think that uh, uh, some verbs come easily to mind. For example, reject, decline. 
that rejections and declinations are part of the family uh, is proven by the fact that they share the fundamental family property that is being negative second turn elocutions. At the same time, they differ in that they respond to different kinds of open calls. So, um, so uh, rejections typically reply to your proposals uh, and possibly to simple requests. Acts of declining typically follow invitations. So the take home message here is uh, uh, we do many different things with the word no. In saying no, we reject proposals, decline invitations, start down offers and so on and so forth. We properly refuse, I suggest, when we are thereby um, uh, replying to a request for permission. And given the nature of permission requests, proper refusals, unlike the other family members, uh, require speak authority. Uh, Notice that what I have said for the word no equal applies to the word yes and to the acts that it typically realizes. So I just, as just one can, uh, can conceive of refusal in terms of a speech act family, so too one can conceive of consent as a family comprising the positive counterparts of the speech acts that we have been talking about. Uh, let me stress that little hangs uh, on the terminological dispute over how we use the verbs at issue. So we may well say or hear people saying that a given proposal has been refused, that a given invitation has been rejected. Well, my primary concern here is not with how people actually use, ordinarily use the verbs at issue. Uh, the main point for my purposes is that these verbs and in principle other verbs as well can be deployed to, uh, to mark, to capture discrete illocutionary acts. Illocutionary acts which have family resemblances, but whose pragmatic structures are not identical. Uh, just a caveat before moving on, a, a speech act family is typically a subclass of a given illocutionary class. So Mitch Green, and I'm here following his terminology, uh, has argued that assertions actually comprise the speech act family, a family that is made up of all those illocutions that commit the speaker to truth. Uh, examples include proper assertions, but also conjectures, guesses, and so on and so forth. So in this line of thought, the assertion family is a subclass of assertives. The, the family leaves out those assertives, uh, such as supposing a content for the sake of argument, which do not commit the speaker to truth. The refusal and consent and consent families, as I have characterized them, are subclasses of an intersection of classes, uh, more precisely of the directives commissive intersection uh, space uh, that is also populated by uh, by uh, hybrid interrogatives, as we saw. All right, so let's move on to the second part of the talk. Uh, in what follows, for the sake of simplicity, I will uh, talk about refusals in general, meaning the speech acts that make up the refusal family. Um, however, I will sometimes use a more fine-grained language and talk about rejections, declinations, and so forth when relevant. So to recap, in the previous section, I have advanced uh, three main claims. First, refusals are second turn elocutions. Second, and relatedly, refusals are performed in response to open calls. And finally, depending on the type of open call they respond to, you, uh, refusals uh, um, comply with different success conditions. In particular, refusals are authoritative speech acts only when preceded by requests for permission. Let us now consider some potential objections to this uh, proposal. So first, one may object 
to the claim that refusals are secondary allocations and uh, contend that refusals may be accomplished in the absence of any previous call by the HIBA. Consider the following case. So James is an intern in a renowned law firm. Every workday starts the same way with his boss Rhonda asking him to get coffee for her and James fetching coffee as she asked. Until one morning when as soon as he sees Rhonda and uh, without even waiting for her to issue the request, James says aloud, no. Why? Uh, well, one, one can, can uh, maintain that such a no is a refusal performed in the absence of any previous call by the Hebrew for Rhonda hadn't issued any particular request that day, at least not yet. Well, I think that <clears throat> despite appearances to the contrary, James no is a second turn elocution for it replies to an habitual request <clears throat> on the part of his boss. So upon repetition, the request acceptance pair becomes a default score component of their morning conversations. Um, this means that uh, uh, James uh, board no is not a refusal performed in isolation. It is uh, a refusal performed in place of the second part of the pair, which by default would otherwise have been an acceptance. Now here, some of you might think that this case is kind of an easy win. Well, <clears throat> Uh, you'll tell me in the Q&A if you can think about uh, uh, good counterexamples, but all the cases involving genuine refusals that I can imagine, even the most sophisticated one, ones, are such that it is always possible to bring to the surface some kind of tacit or implicit call to which the, the refusal is responding. Uh, <clears throat> second, one might object that uh, uh, refusals may also be accomplished in, in response to closed calls. After all, uh, one who is, uh, uh, it seems that one who is ordered or even commanded to do such and such may refuse it as well. Uh, so consider <clears throat> this case, which is a variation of an example famously introduced by Austin. So imagine that in the context of building a military camp in the forest, General Hooks orders Private Freeman to go and pick up wood. Now, if my analysis is correct, then the private should be given no possibility to refuse. And yet she can, and indeed she does in this fictional example, answer no, or no, I won't do it. Well, the private is here refusing to obey the order. But refusals to obey, I claim, are not elocutionary acts of refusal. They are announcements of disobedience. So the way I see it, uh, uh, <clears throat> in saying no, the private is not here refusing. She's rather um, letting the general know that she doesn't intend to go and pick up food. That is, she's performing an expressive of the form, I have no intention of doing it. To see why this can't be a refusal, uh, recall that successful orders impute obligations upon the HIVA. Insofar as the HIVA acknowledges the order's successfulness, she has already acknowledged her commitment to obey. No acceptance is required for the commitment to be created, which means that no refusal can come in the way of that creation. Uh, this case can also be built in a slightly different way. So imagine that Julia and Lucy uh, go camping in the district. district. When they arrive, <clears throat> Julia starts to, uh, to issue orders uh, um, um, addressing Lucy. Uh, at a certain point, she says, go and pick up wood. Uh, well, Lucy answers, no, or no, I wouldn't do it. Uh, well, uh, the difference between this case and the previous one is that in this case, uh, the speaker has no official pre-established authority, which means that her order can succeed only if Lucy grants 
her authority by letting her act pass, by playing along with it. So uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, answering no, um, Lucy is not primarily refusing, nor is she primarily letting uh, Julia know that she doesn't intend to go and pick up wood, even though this is something that she may secondarily do. What she's primarily doing, I claim, is, uh, um, is uh, uh, objecting to Julia's bossy behavior. Uh, in so doing, she prevents Julia from acquiring the informal authority that she needs to perform a successful order in that context. So by drawing on Berlangton's work and blocking and the accommodation of authority, here Lucy would be primarily blocking the, the uh, Julia's attempt to order she would be make that order misfire. Third, <clears throat> one may uh, object that refusals uh, always require speaker authority, that they require authority um, even when uh, the, 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 the call performed by the HIVA is, uh, um, is uh, call other than a request for permission. Uh, so in this sense, uh, what I've called rejections and declinations would be uh, authoritative speech acts just as proper refusals. So, so consider a case that has been put forth by Eleanor Mason. And the case goes as follows. Amanda invites Brian to a party at her house. Brian refuses. Unbeknownst to Amanda, Brian is under house arrest, so he didn't have the authority to accept, which makes his refusal non-ideal or defective. Thinking about exceptional cases like these makes it clear, Mason claims, that authorities needed to decline an invitation as well, even though at first glance it might not seem so. Well, first of all, I'm not that sure that Brian's refusal is defective, but assuming that it is, even though just for the sake of argument, this doesn't show, at least not per se, that authorities needed to decline an invitation. And to see this, consider an alternative scenario. So Mark offers to buy Robin an alcoholic drink. Robin refuses. Unbeknownst to Mark, Robin is a plain clothes officer on duty, so she wasn't allowed to accept, which makes her refusal non-ideal or defective. So assuming that Robin's refusal is defective, uh, uh, clearly uh, that would be so, not because Robin, qua police officer, lacks authority, but because uh, uh, in joining the police, uh, she has acquired a number of obligations, including the obligation not to consume alcohol on duty. Similarly, in being sentenced to house arrest, uh, Brian has acquired new obligation obligations, including the obligation not to leave his house until he has served his sentence. So more broadly speaking, uh, um, any uh, participants to a conversation steps into it with their own deontic status, with a certain package of rights and duties that narrow down or extends the range of speech acts that, that they can successfully perform. Uh, so imagine that um, I promise Luca uh, to pick him up tomorrow at 8 p.m. Well, I can't later fully successfully accept Giorgio's proposal to go to the cinema tomorrow at 8 p.m. This is so not because I lack the authority to agree to or to reject Giorgio's proposal. This is because any speech act, the felicity, the success of any speech act partially depends on the deontic status and the package of rights and duties that the speaker has before performing the act in question. All right. So 
I have at least partially defended the claim that refusals are second turn elocutions requiring speak authority only when preceded by permission requests. Uh, I will now turn to you discuss uh, some potential implications that my analysis has for uh, some recent discussions involving sexual refusal. <clears throat> Speech act analysis of uh, uh, sexual refusal has been sketched by Mary Kate uh, McGowan uh, with the aim of showing that pornography uh, may silence women's refusals to sex. Um, her contribution, just to give you a little bit of background, her contribution falls within the area of feminist philosophy of language and fits into the so-called silencing literature, which stems from Catherine McKinnon's thesis against pornography. Uh, I will only uh, tangentially touch on those theses here, but uh, McKinnon's core idea is that certain pornographic materials spread false gender stereotypes, uh, uh, stereotypes about women always wanting sex or women fantasizing, fantasizing about rape and so on and so forth, which may make it particularly difficult for women to successfully refuse male sexual advances. Now, in a couple of places, Matt Gowen suggests that sexual advances are authoritative speech acts. Uh, in order to successfully refuse sex, so the speaker must have authority over her own body. And to prove the point, she presents the following hypothetical scenario. So imagine that as Sally uh, um, tells to Carl that Cindy is unwilling to have sex with him. Now, even supposing that Sally convinces Carl not to go ahead with sexual advances, her utterance clearly doesn't constitute a refusal. By contrast, if Cindy says no to Carl's sexual advances, that no would constitute a clear instance of refusal. The asymmetry, McGowan argues, uh, results from the fact that sexual refusals are authoritative speech acts. So quoting from McGowan, when Cindy says no in response to Carl's sexual advances, Cindy sexually refuses exactly because she thereby denies Carl permission to proceed. Having authority over who has sexual access to her body, Cindy's here exercising that authority. Uh, Sally, in this line of argument, uh, uh, cannot refuse because she clearly lacks authority over Cindy's body. So uh, in McGowan's perspective, uh, sexual refusals are authoritative acts and sexual advances are, uh, as, the, as the quoted passage implies, requests for permission, uh, more precisely requests to have access to one's potential partner's body. Uh, so otherwise put, McGowan's uh, conscious sexual refusals is what I've called uh, uh, proper refusals. I think this is deeply problematic for it runs the risk of reinforcing a pernicious stereotype about women's lack of sexual agency. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, it runs the risk of marching against the feminist cause that McGowan's proposal was aimed to, to support. So let's see how this may be so. Common requests for permission involve use of or access to someone else's property. As in the laptop case that we discussed earlier, uh, Philip had no right to use the laptop without Lily's permission, exactly because the laptop was Lily's property. Uh, now, at first glance, uh, uh, these remarks fit in perfectly with the case of sexual advances. Carl, and more generally someone who approaches someone else for sex, is not entitled to proceed until the other person is granted him permission to do so uh, because uh, a person's body is under her soul and autonomous control. However, 
The analogy between the two cases is not as strong as it appears. Uh, in the laptop case, Philip is asking Lily permission to do something that does not engage Lily directly. Once Lily answers affirmatively, uh, Philip will use the laptop on his own. Um, but uh, someone who approaches someone else for sex is asking them, at least hopefully, to do something together. Uh, once the other person accepts, they will be engaged in a joint activity. So uh, regarding sexual advances as requests for permission seems to presuppose what we might call a property model of sex, a view on sexual encounters in terms of someone's usage of someone else's body. Um, now, since both partners' sexual agency, positive sexual agency matters, uh, any model of sex that, that implies an agent-patient asymmetrical relationship between the parties is at least prima facie ethically problematic. I think this is even more so once we acknowledge that the asymmetry is heavily biased towards men. Uh, let me be clear on this point, uh, there, uh, nothing about requests for permission implies that women must suffer sex while men are the performers. Uh, after all, we can uh, very easily express ourselves uh, as if it might as well be a woman using a man's body. Um, but given cultural realities, uh, it is a fact that discussions around sex almost always position a man as the active requester and the woman as the one who lets him or otherwise refuses to let him do things to her. So in a model of this sort, sex is pictured as a one-sided activity. It is typically a man having sex with a woman, not vice versa, while women are implicitly pictured as bereft of positive sexual agency. Now, to resist this view, one should reconceptualize sexual advances as, uh, as uh, different kinds of open calls, as open calls other than requests for permission. I don't have much time to go into detail here, but I think that a good candidate is the act of proposing, while a requester tries to make the hearer do something, a proposer tries to get the hearer to take part in some shared activity. So proposals constitutively aim to enlist the other person in mutually bringing about some future course of action. Anyhow, regardless of the specific kind of call we would go for, here the key point is this. If, at least in standard cases, sexual advances are not requests for permission, then no authority is required to refuse them, which contradicts McGowan's proposal. So going back to her fictional example, Sally doesn't manage to refuse Carl's sexual advances, not so much because she lacks authority over Cindy's body, but simply because she's not the addressee of the call, nor has she been licensed to respond for her by the relevant addressee. So in my parlance, Sally would not satisfy the relevance criterion. In passing, such remarks also jeopardize McGowan's view on silencing. So very briefly, she claims that pornography may silence women by undermining their practical authority, may silence women's refusals in particular by undermining their practical authority. But if no authority is needed to refuse sex, then uh, uh, her view appears to be untenable. Right, so uh, from what I have said, uh, from what I've argued, um, it follows that what we ordinarily call sexual refusals should be more <clears throat> properly referred to as sexual rejections. In saying no to sex, uh, no, no proper refusal would be performed. 
And if this is the case, then it is also the case that in saying yes to sex, we are not performing proper consent. Uh, more precisely, if sex is initiated with a proposal, then stricto sensu, one doesn't give one's consent, but rather agrees to it. And the issue here is not merely terminological, for as we saw, consent and agree to are not two ways of, uh, two different ways of naming the same thing. They are different speech acts, which do belong to the same elocutionary family, but have quite different pragmatic structures. So consent is to grant permission uh, and typically presupposes an, an, an asymmetry involved between the parties. So in certain contexts, uh, it may presuppose a person doing things to another person as when we consent to a certain medical procedure to be acted upon our body, so to speak. Uh, in other contexts, so it may involve the person doing things to another person's properties as when we, uh, we consent uh, to, to have our effects searched by the police, for example. Agreed to, by contrast, is to voice one decision to do something with the other person, to join the other person, and this presupposes an agent-agent symmetrical relationship. So to conclude, my analysis may also have implications for and lend some support to models of rape law reform that do without consent. In particular, it may offer some support to Anderson's, Michelle Anderson's negotiation model, which replaces the asymmetric notion of consent uh, with negotiation and agreement. I won't go any further into this because this would be all another talk, but um, uh, what I've tried to do in this last section uh, is to show, to highlight that speech act theory in my analysis, my speech act analysis of refusal in particular, uh, may, may provide some tools uh, uh, that are useful to better understand and to model issues that are of moral and legal relevance. Right, so to sum up, let me quickly, very quickly go over the key uh, points again. So uh, I have claimed that refusals are second turn elocutions, that they are performed in response to open calls and that they require speaker authority only when preceded by permission requests. I've also maintained that the concept of refusal actually captures a whole family of speech acts comprising as many acts as there are open calls types. Uh, right after uh, defending my view against some potential objections, I've drawn some potential implications that this view has for current debates involving sexual advances. In particular, I've argued that if we want to construct sex as a joint activity, as an activity over which both parties have an equal say, so to speak, then we shouldn't analyze sexual advances as requests for permission as both the public popular and the scholarly literature have tended to do. And this amounts to arguing that um, what we ordinarily call sexual refusals and sexual consents actually are not proper refusals and proper consents. All right, so that will be all. Uh, thank you for your attention.